I'm just going to run right into the agenda for today. We have a great interview uh, with John Holm, the VP of Strategic Init Initiatives from Pixera Global. I want to run quickly through the history of Pixera. Mm -hmm. Nothing long, uh, but just really sets us up into then talking about what convening means to each of us. Uh, that's almost the structure we found in our conversation with, with John. Uh, we we reacted pretty heavily almost to what we were saying because we got into some heavy topics, which was so much fun. Um, how does that sound for in terms of structure for today? I like that. Excellent. So um, ultimately, Pixera Global, uh, spelled P-Y-X-E-R-A, kind of an intimidating word if you don't know how to pronounce it uh, to begin <laughs> with. We've, we've known him for a little bit. He's been in our circles, um, but it's been great to now have him on the podcast where we got to, again, I want to start with the history of Pixar Global. It was started in 1990 as a, a reaction almost to the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, it was the, almost, it was like an initiative that was pushed, actually. It started, it started as the Citizens Democracy corporation or corp i actually i think it was oh no uh citizens democracy Corps, um hmm. and it was formed actually with the support of the first bush administration to in reaction to again to the collapse of the soviet union in order to strengthen the foundations of free society in eastern europe which how raw raw 90s does usa does that get like you know let's use business to strengthen democracy um yeah 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 right so yes. uh Sounds ultimately right. they wanted to achieve that by jumping into many of these uh, affected areas and bringing together u.s corporations nonprofits, and government teams so mm -hmm. ultimately really trying to coordinate efforts locally recruit different volunteering agencies or volunteers locally and ultimately on the ground provide assistance for the structure for community businesses, small and medium. So probably building that framework and fabric of business and commerce to strengthen uh, these, these communities post fall of the, 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 the governments at the time um, until obviously something could be pushed uh, more democratically um, hmm. in, in terms of U.S. agenda as, as usual. Um, any follow up there, follow up thought? Uh, yes, I think I, I, very interesting. Like I, I get the, um, like the, the play there. Um, I think it's very, yeah, I guess you're, what you're saying is like very on brand. Um, yeah. Very on brand for us. <laughs> yes. Very on brand USA. Yeah. Uh, but I also think like kind of when you think of just like basic market dynamics, the idealism, I get it, right? Like we are a community of people. We have services to provide each other in the vacuum of the fall of the Soviet Union. Like how do you jumpstart local relationships to support each other? Uh, I think it sounds idealistic and noble and and interesting and cool, but I can also understand like the the dark side of the Adam Smith kind of capitalism is going to save y'all kind of yes approach yeah i mean it really is the jump start of the invisible hand yeah exactly uh, yeah yeah the so really they evolved though too past uh past their original mission in that way mm -hmm. and uh so in 2002 that's when they actually adopted the name pixar global pixis mm -hmm. from the latin term uh mariner's compass and terra from uh earth um, and so ultimately adopting that towards a mission that's very much focused on, I would say, strengthening. These are my words, not theirs. Strengthening the future uh, of, of, of our sustainable future. Uh, and, and, and so in that way, they're, they're really now focused on mobilizing private and public uh, resources to create that inclusive, equitable and regenerative systems um, to break down those words quickly for our audience. We use them all the time, but ultimately inclusivity, meaning bringing more voices into the fold, equitable, really bringing and in, in almost distributing more ownership of those systems, more ownership of the design uh, and the impact. Um, and then ultimately regenerative uh, being really the focus in our world of how do you build a system that's not uh, net neutral, that's not 
uh, almost uh, negative in any way, but is really based on building positive outcomes, something that is, again, regenerating either our agricultural systems, our social systems, and so really adding value back on to what maybe has been lost. Uh, any, again, any additional thoughts there? No, I think that that name is really cool. Um, I think like having a North Star that is oriented by the earth, just really like that image. Um, and cool that they, uh, that they have a long enough history where they were able to evolve in that way. So I guess like change, it's it just sound it's like good validation. Change is possible or like growth is possible within an organization and like taking some cool ethos and, and evolving it for the times. I like that. And to your point, sticking with it. I mean, 30 years of this, they're going to be coming up on their 30 year, 35 year anniversary. Um, just sticking with it. Yeah. Yes. Um, why we thought this would be interesting is circular economy as as a concept is is hard it's really complex and ultimately by definition circular economy involves so many sharing remanufacturing uh small medium-sized businesses um uh, different various business models again even within circular economy of mm -hmm. rentals or lease to owns or whatever's going to promote more ownership and not actually sending more waste to landfill and so ultimately waste diversion in that um, all of those are very complex problems that involve many many threads of many different stakeholders something you're not too familiar with with Reaply uh, could you talk about the six-sided model a little bit that, that Reaply is, is really sure. working within? Yeah. Um, so I guess we haven't talked much about Reaply on the podcast yet, but for our audience, um, Reaply provides a platform that connects um, supply-side players that have surplus, especially in organizations, with either internal or external demand organizations. So let's say... I have a ton of chairs that I am uh, done using because my building, you know, I might be a facilities manager or a space manager at a large building where I have a huge real estate portfolio and, you know, we're ready to maybe close a building down. I might have a ton of chairs um, and need to get rid of them. So who else is in the ecosystem that would need to be involved to help deal with those chairs? That's the model that we started to articulate at Reaply and, and in an effort to paint a picture of what our vision is and the role that we want to play. So I guess to hint at your, or to be more direct about your six side, the six sides that you're referring to. So you would have supply side players, right? Who actually has a surplus? It could be chairs, could be lab equipment, IT equipment, building materials, any surplus. You have the demand side and that's two flavors, right? Internal demand, people within your own organization that need stuff. External demand, people outside of the organization that might need what you have. So it could be, again, like chairs. If we take chairs for an example, you might be a school, you might be another company outside of, of my company. And so that's, we're already at three sides right there. Um, the others that we talked about is the, um, like service provider space. So who's going to help facilitate transactions or support logistics or even support refurbishment and remanufacturing? There are players who could help make the reuse of my thousands of chairs possible or even extend the life of those chairs. Right. So now we're at four. Um, five would be the manufacturer of those chairs themselves. They have a role in the ecosystem because they're the ones who have the most accurate data about the stuff itself. Like, what is this made of? And if I, you know, take it apart and try to recycle it, how can I get the most out of it? Or if I try to refurbish it or remanufacture it, what's the best way to do it? The manufacturer is the one that has them the most relevant data about that and may or may not have an interest in even taking back some of the chairs that they put out into the world. So that's that's five. And six is, um, you know, at Reaply, we seek out organizations who are interested in connecting these five sides of the market. So we call them sponsors, those who are interested in like subsidizing 
uh, jump-starting the circular economy. And I actually see the sponsors as kind of a convener, just hinting towards yeah. a little bit about what Pixera is about. Um, sponsors are see that connecting these stakeholders together uh, could actually accelerate reuse. I mean, we can give an example. A city might be interested in providing a physical storage space so that private organizations can store their surplus while the demand side organizations figure out, you know, can I buy this in one time period? Can I buy this? Uh, and then when can I, I actually use a service provider to move items into the place I need? So very, um, a, lot of, a lot of moving pieces have to come together to make reuse and circular economy and, possible. And to all of that, and I love your last example in terms of aggregation, in so many of those contexts, to the point of which we're speaking about today with convening, none of those sides might actually talk to one another about individual needs and then almost aggregate needs of the system. And so in that way, I know Reaply serving that function, both technology, but then also from a management standpoint of having and convening those conversations. I'm finding the same thing with myself. I mean, so much of what I'm learning um, from Loop Layer and, and talking more about different players in remanufacturing is so many sides don't actually uh, speak about what they need um, to the point about almost on brand for, for United States. That might be because so many <laughs> brands don't want to talk about their own proprietary information or mm. uh, data around their products or even uh, maybe what they don't have because they might see that as a market deficit. Um, but ultimately, if we kind of keep bringing people together, we can solve these problems. And so I love that from an aggregation mm. standpoint because – we found out together that aggregation was really a problem is you might have material volume, but you're actually lacking uh, maybe an end market if you don't have that intermediary step where someone can sit, collect a bunch of more volume together and then sell it even more bulk rates or bulk logistics. Um, that's really, again, where Pixera comes in. And I, I kind of curious of, of your reaction then of, to this conversation. Um, what you'll hear, audience, is Sabira and I, as this topic gets uh, more into the weeds of how complicated it is to navigate partnerships, navigate business models, navigate incentives, uh, Sabira and I are kind of more sucked in on the conversation of, oh my gosh, this is so, so enormous. How do you mm -hmm. reflect back on the conversation we just had recently um, in terms of both you and I were like, wow, this is so much information. This is so overwhelming, but also so inspiring. What was your reaction? I think uh, many things that you'll hear John say are, he, he really does a good job of laying down the facts about some of the big macro uh, power dynamics and motivations of large organizations um, that have perpetuated the systems, the linear systems that really, like we, we, we casually say take, make, waste kind of because we're familiar that, with that, but the facts that he laid out or the, the points that he made really um, personifies the pain and the, just the, the like, human ignorance or the ignorance of other humans and humanity, the, the impact that take, make, waste has um, that is more cultural, more personal, more, um, yeah, I guess like emotional human and, and just um, discriminatory, right? We, we perpetuate a system that ignores the pain that it causes. And um, I think my reflection on that is that it, it's hard to hear, but it's also good to hear and be reminded of that. I think, you know, people like you and myself, we know the things that he has said, we have synthesized in our lives, like, oh, we know these random, random data points all together. We're not happy with the system. And that's why we work in the way that we work. We know those as motivators, but hearing them kind of back to back to back is like, oh crap, like this is much bigger in our day-to-day -day lives. We don't kind of keep that in our heads all the time of how big, enormous, painful our status quo is. And we're just 
on the hamster wheel of operating, trying to slowly turn the ship. And so my takeaway is just a punch in the gut, but stuff that we already know, but it's okay because it reminds you of, you know, why we're doing what we're doing. And I, I that like... sounds all vague. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I, well, good, because they'll get into the details of, of our interview. <laughs> I, I, I like that basically your takeaway is the facts are real. Embrace the punch in the gut. We use it to get up every day to try to do our jobs. And I know many other people will feel the same. Um, I think you summed it up in terms of how I felt. It, it is. There, what he was saying was particularly cutting um, to almost to the core of, of what we probably don't tap into an, enough. Um, with him, and what's always funny to talk about, not funny is maybe the wrong word, is... Um, I don't know the word. You don't you don't get anger a lot, but I think he does directional anger very well. Where he's like, "This is bad. How are we doing this where it's still bad?" And yet he does it with a sense of charm and recognition for. But hey, let's all come together and solve this. Um, and also, I I have to say, and I was struggling to know how to talk about this, and I probably still am struggling to know how to talk about this. He brought in a factor of 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 being a white male in a place of, of, of societal privilege that I still struggle with, of what is my place in some of these conversations to be an advocate, to be an ally, a sponsor, whatever it might be, and, and trying to navigate those. It's fascinating. And he's doing it on such a deeper level where he's actually working with uh, disenfranchised communities um, mm. I don't know. I, I have, I have all the faith in the world. I would know how to do that, but I, I look and admire what he is actively doing every day with Pixera. Um, what I did take from it too, is as I was reflecting on it is almost the serendipitous nature of how conversations, how projects can come and people can connect to solve something. And so it's almost this idea that you have to have a big tent to kind of keep bringing in more voices, keep bringing in more people to try to solve. And when you bring in more voices and more people, we know this, it gets harder to solve something. Um, I, ironically, whatever that might be, because you want it to be more inclusive, but the more inclusive it is, the more complicated it is to navigate incentives and priorities. Um, and so that's difficult, necessary and difficult. And so I think we got into this in that interview, which left us with that, gut punch of, oh my gosh, we have so much, we have so much to do. Um, yeah. With that, I hope you all enjoy the interview with uh, John Holm, VP of Strategic Initiatives. Any closing thoughts there, Sabira? I have one, which might be a long-winded thought, but I will <laughs> do my best to keep it short. I actually came across, I don't know if I, I told you this, Gar, but we, I came across Pixar Global before I met Reapley when I was living oh. and working in India. And they came to visit um, the company that I was working at, which is uh, at Saha Zero Waste in, in Bangalore. And Saha's first, you know, they had a public private partnership that really impressed me and yeah. I think represents a lot of what Pixera does. And um, basically, Saha's worked with the government. It was a, it's a waste management social enterprise, worked with the government to um the government provided space for, to be a local waste management hub where um, the local communities would pay a fee to do to sahas to do a local daily collection of their waste and aggregate mm -hmm. it in the government space and to me that was is that public private partnership that really um brings to life what collaboration and convening looks like. So you subsidize the infrastructure. You still have a local business with a business interest that can provide a service and a value. And the local community benefits because instead of tossing their waste on the side of the road, they have a reliable service collection and they know that their waste is then being processed, either composted or sorted, which just like did not exist yeah. before this partnership existed. And so I guess maybe my final takeaway is that 
I have seen these kinds of things in action. There are many examples of it in action. Pixera advocates for this on a regular basis, and we should seek to um, learn from them, replicate, and um, kind of like bring that ethos in our daily lives. And I think John, John really was honing in on that. It's like, how do you have that mindset of that collaboration and partnership, even when it, in the face of it being difficult? And everybody, enjoy the interview with John Holm, VP of Strategic Initiatives from Pixera Global. Thank you. We met um, a, a while ago. I don't even remember when. It just all is a blur at this point. But um, I've always been fascinated with your your role, um, your role at Pixera, and almost your role in general. You seem to be almost by personality and by definition a convener um, of people and topics and um, trying to connect dots that others might not see. Where do you find yourself in this, and what role has that meant to Pixera Global to be that type of organization? Yeah, it's a it's a really good question. So I think there's a couple of lines to draw in, and, and before we jump into even more pressing issues of like the circular economy, et cetera, just framing. Wise, um, Pixera Global's mission really was built upon aligning the public, private, and social sectors together to solve solvable problems. It's a really unique mission. The mission itself demands that we do this work together. It's a very much of a we. It's a very much of um, uh, an approach that we all have to take to do something together. Um, so it's instilled and born really in our ethos that we have to, to really walk the talk and work in unison to really make the world a better place. So it comes from, from that. I think on top of that, um, is a sense of service and humility in the work we do. I mean, I mean that in the space that, you know, from, from when we look at, you know, our work is helping, you know, communities thrive one community at a time. It's really looking at, looking at everyone at equals, truly equals, and looking at communities and underrepresentation of saying, um, we're not going to come in and tell you what to do, how to do it, and how much money you get. How about you tell us what issues are important to you? We hear you. What we'll do is we'll translate those issues to a bigger group. And so already in the sense of service, you're already adjusting your collective ego to get out of the way f for serving something better, which has really served us well. And I think that's been an organizational characteristic, right? On top of that, um, when you're in the part of being we, you have a very clear way of looking at things that no one else is seeing because your self-interest is just not – your self-interest – is getting others on board with you. So where success is defined, success is not defined by the individual, it's designed by the collective. So immediately when you look at a problem to solve, you're, you're looking at areas of like, well, wait a second, who are the actors that authentically, and we'll come back to that world because that's been greenwashed a lot, who are authentically really trying to solve that problem that we can work together with as humans. I think there's a lot of talk in the space around partnership matters, and I'm using that term because it drives me nuts when I hear terms like systems change and partnership. Are you really meaning what you're saying or is it just using buzzwords? Partnership is hard. Like it's hard. It's hard work. Can you, can you talk yeah. about the dirty of that real quickly? Like I, I think you're mm -hmm. exactly right. Like what does that mean? And I think that probably falls in line with the equity of which you are speaking about, which is sure. balancing priorities and making sure people have a voice. Yeah, I think just on on the language itself, language matters, right? So here's a clear example of where language matters and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more specificity yeah. around yeah. purpose, authentic buzzwords. Um, we have a wonderful way of dulling down what we're doing to the world today, whether that's, it's not global warming, it's climate change. It's food farms, not slaughterhouses, right? You can take everything that we do and you remove the description of what humanity is doing to a person, a product, a thing, all for the efforts of the greater capitalism to buy more stuff to keep on putting in the ground. I mean, that's the reality. We don't want to talk about that reality because that makes us uncomfortable many times. But if we really sit through and listen and look at the problem for what it is, really see the problem. Are you really looking at that problem the right way? Are you seeing it in its full collective away from your own rationalization of how you choose to see it. So when you have these words of, of the day, I mean, I, re I remember starting the conversation in this space back when triple bottom line, people, profit, planet. I mean, come on, 
John Elkington even took that phrase back in 2019, said, went to Harvard and said, that phrase should not be used anymore. It is old. Had the ability mm. to do that. The point is conscious capitalism, shared value creation. Now we're in buzzwords like the circular economy, ESG. What always happens in this space, though, is the idealism of these concepts, which were ideal. They kind of get, they kind of get, um, they kind of get blown away. They kind of get taken away. And when you start thinking about these concepts now that we're dealing with systems change and partnership and together, well, think through that word a little bit. So what we do, and let's talk about now the answer, partnership. Partnership is something that we hold very critical to the work we need to do together. Does not mean, part, not everyone can partner, first of all. Like, you can't just bring anyone in, let's go partner with Exxon to go solve climate change. It makes no sense. Like, it just doesn't. Like, you can't do it. So when you're looking at partnership, you have to really think through what is the problem you're trying to solve? What is the complementary value that you bring to the equation that no one else really can, one, two, what's lacking in the space, the subject matter piece or something that you need to bring in, and then what is the collective oomph, the theory of change, the soul that you have to do that work together. So when you look at the world that we're in right now, what is deathly lacking is one, a common alignment of what the problem is, a common communication around the problem itself, and then identifying different ways of thinking through problems to go solve that problem. And may, you may not agree, in fact, you don't want to agree on everything. I don't, I don't need to agree with, for example, in some of the work we do with the Circular City Coalition, I do not agree with many things Enel has as a private sector partner. But I agree with the end game that we need the renewable energy transition. So you have to think through that and get over yourself of what you think versus the collective need. And I think that's, that's partnership at its core. Our role in that, Gar, is to be the backbone partner and support to mobilize those conversations, to be not just the convener, I would say in any of our work, especially sustainability, we were the ideator. Like we would sit there because we see the space at a macro lens. We can go say, well, wait a second, here's an opportunity here. And that our model, our business model being a nonprofit is designed to solve that problem, attract funding to go after that, right? Which most organizations aren't. In fact, really none are. So that's our role then to be able to procure and get partners on our side. And that's what I get to spend my time doing. Does that make sense? I think that helpful. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Can you what give are, us an example of that, John? And and then in that so too, Sabir, I mean, I'm curious where I, I get that there's a can I pull it apart of where the business model makes that unique to you all and mm -hmm. why that incentive, why there's a lack of incentives for others to operate like that. I think if that, I think those are Yeah. yeah. I mean, our mission, ourself, is to align the public-private social sectors to solve solvable problems. So we, we have to get funding that way. I think the other thing that we're unique in is that we don't judge so hard. Like, it's easy sometimes, Gar, to be an activist. And I say that in the – I'm huge Greenpeace fans, by the way. They have a specific role, though. It's easy, to, it's easy to get angry and jump up and down. And it's also, on the other side, easy when you have all the power and you hold all the agency – to not care about anything else besides your power and agency. What we have to do is understand and navigate that, right? So our, where we have our special sauce is that, let's say we work with a corporation, not all corporations, but the ones that are really trying to do better, how do we work with them to understand the local context, the local environment, and where the solutions are? And I, I can't, like, one of the best ways to describe that is our employee skills-based volunteers and programs where we've taken corporate executives from around the world match them to local nonprofits in 110 countries. I mean, you're talking countries like Jordan and Kazakhstan and Romania and Mongolia and China. And you go on the ground in those markets, you match corporate leaders on the ground with local nonprofits, and then they work on solving problems together. We're behind those scenes putting it together. We created that concept, that idea, right? So that really defines kind of how we can work with companies because at the end of the day, for example, with the corporate sector, they are the problem in this whole puzzle. They own everything. Like if we just look at the world that it stands today and you look at the oligopolies in each of the industries, which are controlling a lot of the legislation processes right now across the world, if we can't convince them to come around and look at the greater good, man, oh boy, it's going to be a long scope. So we can at least influence leadership within that to do that. That's one way we can do it, right? So I think when you answer your space there, I hopefully 
that provides some context. And it's to be an example. Well, there's a couple. I'm going to go a little bit back here and give you one of what we've done with the Joint Initiative Village Advancement Project with John Deere, eight years in India, focusing on rural Rajasthan, India, where we started a program going into rural farming areas. And instead of saying, here's some funding for agriculture and here's what you're going to do with it, we convened this group nine years ago now. What are the problems you're facing? And they came up with some disparate problems that had nothing to do with farming. And we funded them. And what was so interesting is that they linked um, school attendance with tampons, with farming practices, and with um, go-to-market strategies for new crops. And it started in three geographies, and it went to 83 on its own. It organically replicated. That doesn't happen. It only happened because the community itself took ownership of a problem. They identified the problem, they took ownership of it, and they took it together. And we did that with John Deere and a lot of local actors. That program now has gone to Nigeria, and we replicated it there with a program called Rayuya. And that was one, that was a fast company, save the world idea two years ago that won. So the point is, I, I think that, Sabir, that's one way of looking at it where community agency comes in, and one unique thing, which should not, this should not be unique. It should not be unique when we go to a country. And we said we want to work to come in and say, hey, let's forget about everything we want. Um, we see the value in your culture and your humanity and we see what you like. We can be translators and help you support what you want. So what's your problems? And let's throw out everything what everybody's seeing. And is there any way we can help solve them? Something that's so basic, we've not run to any organization that has conversations with communities like that. That's a problem, right? So that's one example. The other example transitions into our work with circular economy, um, and I can dive in a little bit briefly on this one, but I think before talking about the partnership, I think it's important to understand circular economy. So would it be okay to jump and talk about that, or do you I have would, any things before we move there? Yeah, and I would keep it, I mean, I would love to hear Sabir on this, but I, I would keep it uh, macro, I think, you, in, in terms sure. of the angle of why that, because ultimately our audience will understand some nuances um, of absolutely importance. Yeah, yeah. I th I think the key to look at it is in 2018, 2019, when we got into the circular economy game, we saw a problem. We saw a problem that in North America, the circular economy was quickly being um, being two buckets: one, sustainable packaging, which is kind of an oxymoron, and the other one was recycling. That recycling is going to save the world, and we did not see it that way. We saw circular economy as a transition to an inclusive and regenerative state where we can be net positive, not net negative, not net zero, net positive. And we saw the idealism of it. Uh, we, created, we created some programs to test our idea where we thought, well, what if we put historically marginalized communities at the top of the engagement who have reduced, reuse, repurposed behaviors because those are the behaviors that are going to get us out of this mess. That the consumption mindset of the West, of the global North, is what's killing the world. What if we give agency to those people that actually don't need to buy stuff, that have an existence without having to define what makes them happy by a purchase? And so we went to Alaska, Montana with Tribe, Alaska with Tribe, Ghana with Waste Collectors, and um, Southwest Louisiana with the black community who were all underwater, literally and figuratively. And we designed interventions around what their needs were. And that's been really successful. And in the right now, we're getting ready to hopefully activate a reverse logistics hub in Anchorage around this idea. Well, the centerpiece then was putting equity and decarbonization at the first and foremost of this story. And so we created in 2019 and some of the great work we were doing with Reapley and some of the conversations we're actually having with you was, oh my God, uh, we cannot do this transition alone. What if we align the public sector actors that can provide the procurement and policy to enable systems change because without that, that's really just greenwashing. Two, we bring in the private sector actors that have the weight to mandate change and who have a vested business interest in transitioning to circularity. And three, we find the local community members that have all the agency and representation of local community voice and we put those together. And we say, let's solve this together. And so that's what was born out of the Circular City Coalition, which now exists today with NL North America, Reapley, First Mile, Metabolic, Climate Kick, and Pixar Global, is this vision 
to really rapidly decarbonize first the United States, but then other cities around the world through top-down and bottom-up solutions. I think the way that we look at systems change is it's everything. And that the one thing when you look at systems changes, we have to change the model of capitalism as it's currently formed in order to exist. If we do not go at the top of the pyramid here and focus on those 110 companies which are causing 75% of the greenhouse gas emissions in the world, then all we're going to do is be piloting ourselves to the graveyard. So the whole idea with the Circular City Coalition is to incentivize in the transition to a regenerative upstream model, putting in the policy and procurement figures to, to enable that, but leading by the local community voices who are at the front lines of all the climate change, the front lines of all the waste streams, and who actually already have the reduce, reuse, repurpose behaviors already in place because they have to use them to survive. So that's kind of an example in the genesis of where we are. Can you talk about um, that Anchorage example? Because I think reverse logistics um, is a solution to a big gap in the linear economy system, right? The status quo system. And so I'm curious for you to paint the picture for us as to sure. what is the solution? How did it come about? It sounds like there is a local community involved. So. And, and is that associated with the Circular Cities Coalition? How, how piece this all together for us? It's adjacent. And so we've created another coalition called the Reimagine, Reduce, Reuse, Repurpose, Imagine Coalition, focusing on material reverse logistics at scale. And so, first of all, let's unpack reverse logistics. In the current format, reverse logistics is known as product reverse logistics or returns, returns right? We thought, well, wait a second. No, there's also material reverse logistics where you look at all the waste streams that are packing up. They're mostly in historically marginalized communities. Nothing is being done besides leaching of negative health externalities going into these people's lives. What if we create remanufacturing hubs with these waste streams owned by those local populations where they can turn waste into a resource and profit from it? So that's the idea, right? And then we create a logistic hub because one thing that drives us really nuts in the space is that all this talk of the corporate sector of circularity without logistics in it kind of defeats the purpose. If you're not really talking about resource at scale, resource efficiencies, efficiencies of scale, material volumes at scale, and you're not putting that into the government legislation nor including incentives for companies to think about it, again, all this is a joke. We're just fooling ourselves. So the point we started thinking through then is the marrying of material reverse logistics. So what started in Alaska was the idea then that what most people don't know is that there's most more coastline in Alaska than the lower 48 combined. Number two, the Alaska gyre accounts for waste streams from Korea, Japan, Taiwan, Russia, and Alaska. So what's happened over the years is all this waste, like the Fukushima nuclear waste um, I just, all this waste goes on Alaska shorelines. The problem is, Sabira, is that it sits on shorelines and with global warming, what happens is that it decomposes into the streams, the fish get it, microplastics into them, and it destroys the habitat. Two, all this land is on tribal land. There's no sanitation or waste streams or landfill in Alaska. It's so sparse, so there's no place for it. Three, the cost of goods and material to Alaska, for example, construction material, are eight times more expensive in Nome than they are in Seattle. So what you have in Alaska is a unique case study, a unique case study where climate change is directly impacting indigenous communities with the frozen tundra and ice melts and waste streams. Two, an economic incentive identifying ways to remanufacture waste of product for Alaskans owned by Alaskans. And three, enough feedstock, this is the key, to create products at cost within our capitalist linear model. So where we are with Alaska then is if you type in, first of all, keepers of the North and you do a search, you will see a, a, a YouTube video of a documentary done on it, which does it really justice. Um, it's over had 10 million views talking about this project, who we convened and brought to the table. But to make a very long story short, uh, we're looking at attacking three waste streams. One, uh, from plastic from marine debris, plastic from backhaul tribes, and plastic from municipalities all together into one hub on the port of Alaska where waste will come in and concrete aggregate will come out. 
There's a solution developed by CRDC, which turns even styrofoam into concrete aggregate, right? Kind of the dream, which can be used to make building blocks, which can be used on the ground to be remanufacturing product. And so the other thing I will say to that, it also sequesters the plastic for the longest time possible. Um, real quick note on how Pixera Global views plastic. Plastic is an emergency material. We have to do something to mitigate all of the externalities it's causing while also trying to turn off at the tap simultaneously. It's not either or. And so what we view with this project is that we can take plastic, change the chemical compo composition of it, convert it into to concrete aggregate, and use it for building material, which can have a lot of value for local Alaskans. The last thing that's interesting about that is that that recycling hub that's on the ground, Central Recycling Hub, that is in Anchorage on the port, they are owned by the Bering Straits Tribal Corporation. So it's owned by tribe. And so, again, what you have is all the waste caused by, and here's where I'm going to get really direct, caused by white people is being owned and taken in by indigenous and converted into money-making opportunities, which if you think about it, is kind of an ironical dream. And so that's kind of, that's how the Alaska project works. And that's a sub part of the Circular City Coalition. The Circular City Coalition is focusing on three buckets, which really can decarbonize quickly. That's food systems, renewable energy transition, and the built environment. And I think in all those three areas, it's finding, I would say, net positive business models to find solutions and having federal, state, and city support of um, incentives and eventually taxes on making sure we enable that. There's so much to unpack there. Sorry, I know. <laughs> it's well, massive. I, yeah, it is. And where does the capital come from to catalyze that? I mean, we want this to be sustainable in its own right, so that's going to be financial. Sorry, I'm rubbing my head right now because I'm, right. I'm, it's, it's really frustrating. Because that's okay. your life, is, is <laughs> finding that, that capital. Um, but ultimately, I mean, that comes from being the convener, trying to get right. connect to the money pieces just as much as the people pieces. What almost, I mean, look back, you could even do this too. I'd love to know historically, what has that meant to gain that capital, to catalyze that, at least spark that uh, sustainable business model or um, some type of uh, cascading loop or feedback loop of a solution. Um, you mentioned earlier that, that you, know, you can replicate the models across different uh, regions. And then that should show some success of saying, hey, if we get this amount of capital, we can spark it and then it's going to live on its own. What does that mean for you? What does that mean for Pixera? I think it's really hard because I think it, there's two lines. I think like most folks who are kind of like, it'll get there, it'll get there. I right. think when you look at all the science right now, humanity's falling off a cliff and no one wants to talk about it. Right. I mean, really, it's the movie Don't Look Up. It, it, we're dealing with this every day. And I think there's a couple of things. One, most of our funding in the past came from private sector on programs that would enable this and some USG funding. Yeah. Um, by the way, Pixar Global never got involved until now into fundraising in the foundation, private foundation, ultra high network space. We hmm. were advisors and implementers of good. And so we would like more of a service provider and doing the work, lifting up our sleeves and wanting to be an ally. What we're finding right now is that there's no time. And so we have to really think through then to solve these most pressing challenges to find, I would say, unrestricted funding for donors and funders who have made tons of money on the take make waste model to understand the situation that they're not capable of understanding it and to get out of the way. And the best form of humility to enable the ones and the people and the few and the coalitions that can really helpfully check a box to move humanity the right way to get out of the way. That is really hard because most of these organizations that have all this high net worth funding, um, one, they're either sin washing from their past or two, they have a lot of skin in the game of needing to guilt free a lot of change or have think their voice matters a lot. I think the concentration of wealth in the world right now, where it's in a few of the many is further than we've ever seen before in our lives. And I think this is a really challenging process for us to face. The Biden administration on the USG side has done a pretty good job here of creating, for example, with IRA funding, allowing hearing the first time we've ever seen EPA, community agency, community benefit organization, money going directly to communities and tribes. Well, the problem with that translation though is that these tribes and these community-based organizations have no resource to apply for these grants so while there's progress 
the progress isn't nearly clear enough. And on the USG side, I want to say a couple of things. One, um, USG provided $2 trillion of subsidies of oil and gas last year alone. That's fact. Fact. We're drilling in the Arctic right now in Alaska. That's fact. We're drilling in a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. Fact. So my point is, it's not nearly good enough. On the other end, um, we, I went to Circularity where I think I saw you, Gar. We talked a lot, right? And I think the most frustrating thing with Circularity was the private sector side. Here's what the private sector says around Circularity and giving money to these things. We need more data. We need to test a pilot. We don't have enough money. So here, let me just run off some money for you. Saudi Aramco's net profit in FY22 is $120 billion. Google's $85 billion. Apple, $54 billion. Exxon, $55 billion. Do you get my drift? So here's what we see in this space right now, which is really frustrating. Organizations may say they want systems change. They don't. Companies don't. They're incentivized not to. Who are the ones that are incentivized? Well, we have to think about incentivized to change. NL Energy, they are incentivized to, to own renewable energy space. We need their help. Who are the other companies that are incentivized for take, make, waste, reduce purpose models? Reaply. Great. Where's the capital? I think that's what we always have to think about is, one, the conundrum of our time. Can we fit the vision of a circular model of what we view collectively of what within the planetary boundaries of what we need within the current take make weight consumption model i think we need to spend more time asking that question instead of jumping off to a pilot and trying to meet a theory of change which is not going to move a needle and we need to focus on the hard questions and i think what i'm trying to do gar and sabir in my time is not to be an activist but to be one that's going to just go right again at every single venue before I even start. Um, did you know that 120 companies are responsible for 75% of the greenhouse gases? I'm talking fast now because it's irritating. I'm talking fast now because none of the news media that we have, the people that we just digest and click on all day, we don't educate ourselves. We're blind, and, but we're purposely blind. Like we're, we're not blind because we don't know better. We know better. We just can't get off the wheel. And so I think... And our role as convener and designer and is that we have to hold the flame a little bit and accountability to make people wake up. I think that concluding point, John, is something I'm really curious about is as the convener, and it seems like the spicy fact teller, um, are you seeing because in the end, right, like we all are, we all are humans. We all want to get through the day without, with minimizing our suffering, right? But we want to also then contribute to um, positive strides, right? And circular economy is one way to do that. Of course. But our people, like in the end of the day, right, when we're talking about Reaply and selling to our potential customers, pilot becomes... Uh, an option on the table because we're talking to humans who have to convince other humans yes. of a systems change. And I think as a convener, I'm curious, like, how can we be better at either telling our stories or influencing or, um, yeah, like lighting the fire so that, that, that we don't stay stuck in pilot land? Let's jump that down for a sec because you make a really valid point. I love it. I think we're in the same space you are. We, we're trying to be influencers and trying to identify the internal influences of those companies who are with us and align them to move faster. So it's yes and. It's always yes and. Yes and you have to do that work. Yes and you have to pilot and try and strive and get people on it and get them moving and enable. It's not either or. I think when you look above it, a couple of things come really clear and you made a good point of everyone wants to try. I don't, when I made the comment earlier and I want to take that back to a sec to provide context on it, we're blind because we have no choice but to be on the hamster wheel. You know, the net savings of American households, I read something more than 55% of the, the population has less than $5,000 in their savings. It's not the fault of the people, it's the fault of the few that control the power. The only way only way we can help solve this then is to be um, civic engaged. Are you voting? Are you representing? Are you fighting? And all of us have a duty to that space. So the and is, I would say, Sabir, two things. 
Absolutely. And especially with Reaply, your business model is designed, man. Your business model is designed to do the right thing. That's already amazing. Go deeper. Go big. And try to get that voice when you get in. You have to sleep at night, pay your bills, do your thing. Ask yourself further. The other thing you have is influence, right? You have influence to the corporate sector to keep on and pushing. And then two, you have influence in your communities. We need to bring that back a little bit. Um, there's a gentleman. His name is Indy Johar. And he is the head of mission for Dark Matters Labs. And I had the ability and the opportunity to hear him speak. And he was talking about climate change and where we are right now. We're suffering, we're, we're confronting the existential problem of our time. But he said, what if instead of making it negative, we make it positive? What if we emancipate humanity to be our best selves? And we design and redesign how we work, how we operate. We lift ourselves up. I think one thing that's missing, Sabira, is fear. Fear sells, right? We know when a hurricane comes, everybody goes and buys stuff from Walmart. The media tells us, oh my God, oh my God, next step, I got to look at news, we're going to die. Oh my God, something bad's happening. What's missing is the aspiration that, wait a second, not only can we solve this, how do we look at this journey as our next stop in our evolution as a species to make the world better? Indy Johar was really clear on doing that, which woke me up a little bit too. That to, you, to the last point of your question, Sabir, we also need to be aspirational that we can work together to unlock a lot of beauty and not get stuck on hiding and saying the world's going to burn and I can't do anything. Yes, you can. The powers that be want you to say you can't do anything. The ones that control the money, the weight, the, that, listen, it's, it's this old, it's the dinosaurs. Well, not that old. It's as old as the Crusades, <laughs> right? <laughs> I, so. I think that's when being in startup land, um, it's something I always used to talk about too, whether at Reaply or, or what I'm doing right. now, which is how much exponential energy it takes for any individual, any team to move and make budge the status quo. And so right. ultimately the status quo is entrenched. The business models are there to un unroot those takes a lot of time and energy and conviction yeah. and passion. Um, yeah. and, and I think to your right, there, there is both active interests that move against any untrenching, but it's the passiveness that's almost the insidious part, which is like active may not even really need to do that much because, you know, un, unrooting a business opportunity, a model, a business, even a whole corporation that's the tough part. Um, Absolutely. And, and, and so ultimately, again, it just takes everyone to do exactly what you did, which or you said, which was uh, become civic minded, become more engaged um, and try to figure out, OK, what can I do even in my day to day? What can I do uh, to do that? And I would say with both of you, especially in the generation where you are and not old, but I'm above it. Right. Um, what's missing is leadership. There's a void of those speakers that could take people with you. Both of you are influencers. Both of you, I listen to you, you take me with you. Um, I, I call on you both a little bit because you have that skill. More of that is needed. We, we, we need the great communicators over time. Where are the Gandhis, the Martin Luther Kings, the MLKs, the even to a degree, Barack to a degree, who are the ones that have the voice to lift us up to be better and a greater good? And, and call that out and try to actually, instead of running away from it, go seek it. And I think, you know, I know this is a little bit kumbaya, but it's kind of taking a second. If we're not thinking through this before we go do our work, we're missing the point. Like we need the North Star. I'm curious then, before we round this out, we mentioned this in the beginning. It's easy to be a voice. Uh, it's actually, it's kind of on to your point. It's easy to be a voice filled with anger and to point yeah. and rage at something. What's your advice for those that maybe don't know where to start, don't know where to how to feel? There's an anxiety to all of that needs to be done. But how do you take that first step, not have that be filled with anger, but have that be filled with opportunity and be emancipated by the uh, the freedom to try to go try try something? That's a really good pro that's a really good question. I think it depends on geography, context, culture, where you are. So I think it would be uh, it's a great question. I can't answer that for everyone, right? Um right. I think if I'm looking in where we are in the US in our current state and time, there's so much resource 
available in technology to find those actors of where to go if you're curious. I think the key thing, Gar, is, and you mentioned a couple of traits, curious, ambitious, and want to learn. If you're all those things, you can all get into this. This is not brain surgery, right? I think that's kind of the key is inform yourselves. And there's places to do that if you just do a search to find that. I think the most the, the, the element, I think, for us in our day-to-day, -day, which is key when we look at things, oh, you mentioned anger. Um, I think turn the anger into the simple question is, is that going to get me anywhere? Is that getting us anywhere? I mean, obviously everyone feels good to bet, right? I think try to look at the problem and meet people where they are empathetically, and if you don't have any shared experience, sympathetically, and try to see their viewpoint. But... And a big but. This has been a long game of power dynamics. Know that you're in a game. If you don't think you're in a game, then you're being played. Know that. Know that there's a system built for a long time. And I'll just give you a clear example. From Keep America Beautiful to the Alliance in Plastic Waste. And you look at all of those narratives and the design. That is specific. Make no mistake that civics were taken out of our schools in the 60s and 70s. That was specific. And make no mistake in 1980 when a certain president came in that suddenly governments were bad and that the private sector was going to save the world. That is specific. What I think we need to do then is that if you don't agree with those principles is align with others who don't and join hands. We're not, don't be siloed anymore. Find others. I think the greatest gift that I've been given with our organization is that because we're not about us I, we, me, we get to bring other people with us who open up eyes saying, oh, I can do this? Yeah, you can. But we have to allow, and you, everyone has to allow that gate to happen to be able to say that, oh, there's, there's a team I can join. And note that some groups of people who have been spat on for hundreds and hundreds of years will take a lot longer to give you your trust. And I'm feeling that in every conversation I have, whether that is with um, historically marginalized black communities, whether that is with tribe, because of the position, and, and Gar, I'm looking at you now. Look at us in the face right now. We're both a certain dynamic. We're both white males at the top of the food chain. I would say even you and I have an even deeper responsibility to call out ourselves, to call out that power and to seed and give power as much as we can. Any opportunity to step out and get out of the way, right? And so I think any action for us is to do that. And if we're not doing that, uh, that doesn't feel right. <laughs> it's wrong. <laughs> Hi, and maybe to round this out, I think I would say, John, your your narrative, your story, uh, and I think openness to acknowledging like who you are and what role you play is um, sp spicy and inspiring. Um, and I think uh, I appreciate you calling us influencers, but also like acknowledging that for yourself as well. And um, I think our generation has a lot of learning to do about convening in that way as well from from the people who have come before us. And um, yeah, I, th I think your work is appreciated. I think what we thought we were going to talk about today, we didn't. Uh, I thought we were going to talk more about convening and the history of circular economy and where you see it going. But I think your specific examples um, really paint a picture of what's possible uh, and and like the facts that you pulled out, not from the air, but from reality it are are telling us to what we need to focus on. So I guess I wanted to say thank you for that. Well, you're welcome. I mean, I think, I don't know if it's we're welcome. I appreciate the voice and this is just a fun conversation. And if there's a part two of now taking that lower level and talking specific actions, would love, 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 love to do it, I think. Um, I think one thing is just this is a recent development in the past five or six months, especially having funding conversations with the Circular City Coalition. Um, if we're not thinking about this meta level first, it this all attaches to everything that we do, but we have to be able to come up a little bit and see it. And I think, um, you know, happy to share some of that for today. Every time I see you at a conference, I love hearing your challenging opinions and you're pushing our industry. Uh, I think it's it's helpful. I think it, you are the unwashing that is always trying to 
get washed. Um, so you're you're here to again be like, hey, <laughs> we can't keep throwing this through the cycle. It's got to be. We got to talk about this. So um, thank you for taking more time today. There will be have to be a part two, and we will bring Amazing. that at, at some point. Um, and thank you again for for taking the time and and guiding us through some some comp almost really complex emotions as much as it is topics and and heady uh, uh, idealistic ideas so um thank you thank you for your time it was great appreciate it